So, let's review. Yellow gems lit the way through the deep, dark corners of the continent, all the while orange gems just work to make us lazier and lazier. So what comes next? Well, power. And lots of it, folks. Purple gems may just boast the most potential uses around, which could lead to an argument of them being one of the most important gems in general. From allowing us to access magic crafts themselves to a few hidden mechanics, you will want to know about purple gems. So then, let's get to it. And we begin with something not featured in any of the other gem videos. The ability to create our own. Purple gems are unique in that we can refine a single red and blue gem into a single purple one via press the hat dictator under the refinement tab. Now we haven't yet talked about either red or blue gems, beyond our all gems video here of course. However, I still advise that you dig graves, rumble through tumbleweeds, kill red and blue hounds, and more to just start obtaining what you need to actually refine these things. But speaking of rumbling through tumbles, we can actually do just that to get purple gems too. Thing is, however, we have but a 0.01% chance to roll one. Not great. Not great at all, actually. But it is one of the safer options out there still, and chances are you'll walk away with some other good loot regardless, so there's that. But moving on here to yet another new source mention, Clockworks. Well, Clockwork Bishops to be exact, as they are the only type of clockwork to actually drop any sort of gem at all. And would you believe it, it is purple gems we're talking about. No worries if your world generates without many of these guys on the surface. We've got plenty more backup options coming soon. But a quick final note here, mining a completed marble sculpture during a full moon will actually spawn its corresponding clockwork and not its shadow piece. So if you want a guaranteed bishop, then here you go. But ah uh, yes, sunken chests. I have now discussed the process of obtaining these things in the previous two gem guides, as well as in their own specific guide here. So I'm just going to stick to the basics from here on out. You find Pearl via messages in a bottle out on the water. You read another message in a bottle after being near her in hopes of spawning the next mark spot. You befriend Pearl for a pinching winch blueprint. You create said thing, sail to the X, and then retrieve your chest. A chest with a chance at two separate purple gem rolls, mind you. Good luck. It's going to take a while. As will this. Well, depending on your method of murder, I suppose. No ifs, ands, or buts about it, folks. Dragonfly drops one purple gem guaranteed with a chance at a second. So if you've got her fight down pat, then enjoy consistent gem drops every 20 days when she respawns. Good stuff. But our quest for purple power on the surface actually ends there, everyone. Cause now, now we're ruins bound. If your world spawned with little to no bishops above ground, then chances are you'll have to get your fix with damaged bishops here in the ruins proper. They too drop a purple gem every single time, so be safe and get the damage in them beyond repair. But when we're down here, many clockworks are already done broken, so all we need is a hammer to reap their spoils. Yeah, sure, we may spawn an actual clockwork when doing this, but we've also got a 5% chance at a purple gem drop, so I say it's worth it. Plus, you have a 25% chance at a red gem, which is just half a purple gem if you want to think about it that way. Smash away. Or mine away instead with ancient statues here. An ancient statue's staff can tell us what gem it will drop, like how I know I'm beginning a green gem from this dude here. Note, however, how statue bases can also indicate gem drops too, like how this one has a yellow gem socketed. So then, find an ancient statue with a purple gem staff or base, and would you bloody believe it folks, you're gonna get a purple gem drop from him. Easy peasy. But man, we're just smashing everything down here, ain't we? Breaking broken ancient pseudoscience stations also has a chance to lead us to purple gems. However, it's a mere 0.56% chance, mind you. You're gonna find way more trouble than gems, if you know what I mean. You might also have trouble navigating the labyrinth, as, well, you know, it's a frickin' maze of hatred. 
That said, you could get lucky and find some purple gems along the way in these ornate chests. But not only is there a 15% chance of doing so, there's also a very good chance that the chests are going to be trapped too. So if you believe it's worth the risk, then go for it. However, they're not my first choice at the end of the day. Especially when at the end of the labyrinth lies the ancient guardian folks. A boss that when killed drops a large ornate chest that has a 66% chance at dropping purple gems instead. Not only that though, it could be anywhere between 3 to 5 purple gems at one time to boot. Great stuff. Well. Potentially, that is. And that is always something to keep in mind, is not every source will be viable for everyone. I'm just here to list the sources, mind you, like cave holes here. Cave holes have a 12% chance to generate with a single purple gem, and are dotted all about the wilds and ruins, so just keep an eye out. But one last note about said sources, everyone. At least the sources down here in the caves. They are all renewable through a ruins reset following an ancient fuel weaver kill. So more purple power coming right up. No, seriously, as it's now time to talk about the uses for purple gems, like the building of a shadow manipulator here. Now a shadow manipulator grants us access to all magic crafts in the game, so yeah, it's pretty darn important, which makes purple gems important too. So get one built ASAP, as they're also just going to help you access even more purple gem crafts like the Bat Bats. Costing Battlesk Wings, Living Logs, and a purple gem, a Bat Bat deals 42.5 damage a hit, all the while leeching 6.8 health from our targets at the cost of draining 3.4 sanity per hit from us while doing so. It's a great situational healer, meant for more brief healing times, or in cases where the mobs you're fighting have a low health pool or two. But enjoy it regardless. But here's where the fun begins. The telelocator focus has a lot going for it. So hold on to your butts, everyone. I'm going to quickly explain it all. So at the cost of 50 sanity a spell, we can teleport darn near every mob and boss in the game to a random location on the map. Still at the cost of 50 sanity, we can choose to do that very thing with ourselves, so have at it I suppose. When it and additional purple gems are used with a telelocator focus, we can, yup, you guessed it, focus the teleport and zap things directly where we planted said focus. And yes, we can do this to ourselves too, and we can even be sure to go to the right one by standing on the other one if you know what I mean. But to continue, each use of the staff also has a chance to cause the world to see rainfall, so that's kinda neat. Lightning could strike the user and this does overcharge WX78 players in case you didn't know. And and finally, the staff will not work in the caves. Instead, it simply causes many centralized earthquakes on where you cast it. Make notes. The Nightmare Amulet is next and has several uses as well. Like allowing us to experience total insanity while we have it equipped, which could be beneficial for nightmare fuel farming, as more nightmare creatures actually spawn with an amion as compared to just being insane normally. They also allow us to pass through obelisks down in the atrium, so make note there. And finally, the amulet is darn near essential for the fuel weaver fight come his invincibility phase. Insane indeed. But let us keep the ball rolling with the purple moon lens here. And as with most moon lenses, we can use a purple one to mark various points of interest on the map as they remain on our maps as icons as you can see. Thing is, however, they are a rare case as they go into a couple more crafts like the Ocu Vigil here. Now, it too is essentially a glorified map marker. However, it goes a little beyond by always keeping wherever it is built loaded in the game's mind. For example, when the Bee Queen is dead, her honey patch appears like this until she has respawned, but the map won't actually update the honey patch map's icon until we go over there and reload the area ourselves. But an Ocu Vigil does keep the area updated, so once the Bee Queen is respawned, we will know it from the map alone, no matter where we are. 
Cool stuff. Purple moon lenses are also needed to finish the portal paraphernalia craft in order to transform the floric postern into the celestial portal here. And appropriately enough, our next craft plays well with it, as a moon rock idol from under the celestial tab will cost one moon rock and one purple gem and allows us to essentially sacrifice it in order for us to change characters on the fly. Very, very nice. But a few last crafts here. Walter can use purple gems for his slowdown rounds that, yes, you guessed it, slow down whatever they hit by 33% for 30 seconds, bosses included. Wigfrid's startling soliloquy also requires a purple gem and can be used to panic mobs, boss minions included. The premier gardener hat needs at least one purple gem to allow for us to truly see the nutrients within our farm plots nowadays, although that doesn't matter all that much to the point of actually going out of your way to make these really. But finally, purple gems socketed into the Crab King increase the amount of geysers that form come his geyser attack. It's bad but it's counterable. So there you go. No, seriously, there you go, everyone. Purple gems and their many, many uses within Don't Starve Together. Heck, we didn't even mention the possibility of powering one known as generators with the things. But thanks for watching, folks. Well wished to all, purple power. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.